academic and best-selling author Ibram X. Kendi faced a backlash on Twitter over a series of tweets about Amy Coney Barrett's adopted children from Haiti. Kendi tweeted, Some white colonizers adopted black children to use them as props in their lives while cutting out the biological parents of these children. Kendi continued on, saying that whether this is Barrett or not is not the point, but rather the belief that white people are inherently not racist if they adopt a child of color is the point. Mm -hmm. Here to weigh in on the matter is friend of the show and journalist Zed Jelani. Great to see you, Zed. Good to see you, Zed. Yeah, good to be here. So before uh, we get your reaction to that particular tweet, could you just give people a sense of who Kendi is and why we should care what his thoughts on the matter are? Yeah, so Kendi is actually one of the best-selling uh, authors in America right now when it comes to matters of racism. Uh, he has for a long while had a kind of academic post at American University. It's now being transferred to Boston University, where he basically has a center that uh, does things like compose uh, trainings on racism, does, does a lot of academic research on racism, and basically he's cited as a I frequently cited as a scholar uh, on on matters of racism. Uh, he has a column for The Atlantic as well. And I think that uh, up until recently, he had one of the, I think it was maybe number two or number three best-selling book on Amazon, uh, given what had happened in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. So I think he's definitely cited as kind of a stern and author an authority uh, in terms of matters of race and racism. And he, along with Robin D'Angelo, has seen a real surge in interest in sort of his, his trainings, his books, his lectures and his ideas, I think, over the past few months. Yeah, and Zed, I mean, he's also listed Time 100, I think rightfully. I think he's probably one of the most influential thinkers on race in America, and I've had the misfortune of having to suffer through some of his books. Tell us about why it's important. What is what is what does this reveal about Kendi's so-called anti-racist ideology, this targeting of Amy Coney Barrett's adopted children? Look, I think that, uh, you know, when, when all you have is a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So in order to uh, entree himself into the debate over Amy Coney Barrett, I think he does have to somehow uh, decide that she's racist in some way, shape, or form. I mean, the, one of the things that Kendi says is that you can either be racist or anti-racist. There's nothing in between. There's no not racist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the same way in the 1950s they said you're either a communist or you're anti-communist. There's nothing in between. Um, and that part of the reason you say that is to box somebody into what you define as the anti, right? So in the 1950s, that meant McCarthyism, meant Korean War, Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera, HUAC. Uh, now it means anti-racism as defined by Abraham Kendi, which, you know, partly includes things like preferences and quotas and institutions and so on and so forth. And I think that Kendi, um, you know, he, he has that hammer and therefore... Amy Coney Barrett, who adopted uh, two of her children from Haiti, uh, therefore becomes the nail. Uh, it becomes an opportunity to have to prove that she is racist in some way, shape, or form. I mean, later on in his follow-ups, he said he wasn't talking specifically about her, but he was responding to someone else who brought her up. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, again, when you when you have to frame every single issue this way, you really can't spare someone. Uh, it, 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 can, it can be that he has no evidence that she has any kind of racial... Or, or I would say out, outward racial prejudice uh, or has demonstrated that in some way. Uh, but if it can be made, if the case can be made that somebody could adopt, theoretically adopt children from Haiti and still have this, this deep, dark racial animus, well, he, he's going to make it. So I, I think that's kind of what he did. Uh -huh. And I think that was the first time really where I saw a widespread kind of social media backlash to him because I think a lot of people, when they look at Kendi, they just think that guy's against racism. You know, everyone's against racism. It's like saying you're, you know, you're for puppies or something like that's it's in the year 2020. Nobody says, oh, I love racism. I want to be racist. Right. They all want to be an anti-racist. They all want to be against it. And I think that's the success of his branding. Uh, but I think they don't quite understand how much ideology is smuggled in that terminology as he's crafted it at this at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, there are overt racists, for sure, in 2020, but you're right. Look, overwhelmingly in America, if you ask people, they want to be anti-racist, of course. Talk a little bit more about that backlash, because, I mean, to me, look, I oppose, like, every fiber of Amy Coney Barrett's ideology, right, what she's likely to do on the court, what we've seen in terms of her judicial philosophy with regards to worker rights, with regards to corporate power, is absolutely abhorrent. So when I see something like this, I'm like, 
what are you doing? Focusing on calling her a white colonizer. Like, yeah. why are you going down this incredibly unpopular path rather than focusing on what we know about her and her philosophy and the way that it's going to impact all people and disproportionately, of course, people of color, um, were she to ascend to the Supreme Court. So what was the reaction to this tweet? Did you see overwhelming condemnation or were there people who were, you know, taking up for him and saying, yes, she's, you know, a, adoption is somehow about white colonization? Yeah, I mean, I think most people were kind of separating themselves from him. I don't I don't think there were a whole lot of defenders. There were a few. Um, but I think it gets back to the labeling. Like what I was saying about being the year 2020, even people who have a lot of racial animus will not identify that way. Like they will not say I'm racist, right? Like this is it's not like a proud thing to be declared in this year. Um, but for Kendi, uh, if you always have to be either racist or anti-racist, if you're not with his program, uh, it's very quick to you. You have to be racist because you can either be one or the other. It's a binary. And But as you said, I think part of the problem here is that there isn't really a there isn't a high level of consciousness about what the court actually does. So mm. over the past few years, uh, it's been a conservative led court. Uh, but the kind of, you know, Handmaid's Tale or, right. you know, white nationalist or whatever, like, you know, whatever the, the fever dream of liberals is of the day uh, has never come to pass. You know, it has not come to pass in four years of Trump. It hasn't come to pass in this Roberts led court. In fact, the Roberts-led conservative court is fairly libertarian, right? They've, they've dealt Trump a bunch of blows on social issues. Uh, they're, they knocked down some abortion regulations in Louisiana recently. They sided against Trump on DACA. Uh, they made it illegal to fire someone for being gay or lesbian. It's actually a fairly socially liberal court, even one that's basically run by Republican-appointed judges. Now, Amy Coney Barrett may make it slightly more conservative in that direction, but the area where it's really gotten much more, I think, to the traditional right is on these business issues, on worker issues, consumer regulation issues, antitrust issues. Uh, we have to remember this was a court that basically installed right to work for public employee unions. It, this is a court that more or less uh, knocked down campaign finance law with Citizens United decision. This is a, a very libertarian court, right? And I think people don't know how to wrap their minds around that. So they default to the, well, they're going to outlaw abortion for everybody, which is extremely unlikely they'll even overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, really, if you look at the court, if you look at what John Roberts in particular said about these things, these matters and the fact that he is the chief justice, it's very unlikely that they would do that even with Amy Coney Barrett installed. But it's very likely that we would see undermining of things like consumer protection law, like worker regulations. That If a state, for instance, passes uh, mandated paid leave, maybe a business group will, will wage a legal challenge against that and they'll be successful with a 6-3 court. So those issues are probably the ones that the court's actually likely to rule on, but they're just not the kind of culture war hot button things that jump around on social media, that MSNBC loves to talk about, that people will compare to, you know, Handmaid's Tale or Harry Potter or The West Wing or whatever people are watching on TV. Um, but those are the issues that I think motivate the majority of Republican Party donors, consultants, the political class. That's really why they want these courts. They're, these, a lot of these people are social liberals themselves. I think they're, they don't mind abortion very much. Yeah, I don't think right. they're very religious, right? But those, is, but those culture war issues, whether it's race or racism or it's uh, you know gay rights or it's abortion, issues where the Supreme Court probably isn't going to side against conservatives very much, uh, they're just much easier to talk about. They're very easy to boil down. Uh, people like Kennedy can always you know take out their hammer and pretend everything's a nail and start talking about those things. When actually it is a massive distraction from the issues of, of what the Supreme Court is actually going to be ruling on and dealing with. One of the things it will be ruling on and dealing with will be the, the ACA in, in the coming year, I think. Um, so I think that, unfortunately, uh, this is what happens when you have such a superficial political debate. Uh, yeah. You start debating things like Amy Coney Barrett's personal religiosity or her family rather than actually looking at her large series of rulings and, and the amount of time that she's been on the court. Right. It's it's kind of amazing, Zed. I mean, so well it's, it's it's very well said. And again, I mean, this you go after her adopted children. I mean, you could easily make it. I'm not you know, making this case, but I'm saying if I was a smart leftist, I'd be like, oh, well, she's going to strike down the ACA, which is going to disproportionately affect black people who don't have health care. I mean, like you could say that. Right. That, I mean, and, and but he does not think in a structural way. And that's, again, why I wanted to, to bring this up with you. And you've always you know, been so well spoken on these issues is that this is a dominant ideology 
in the American elite. Like, can, just I want you to lay that out for people. This is anti-racism, the book, best-selling thing. This is mainstream stuff. It's not fringe. And this is what it actually means to people and the way they structure or they analyze things that are happening in American society. I mean, it is. I mean, I, what it's, it's interesting to me how much Kennedy is held up by people in that sector. So, for instance, when he was listed in Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people, it was sponsored by Citibank and written by Al Sharpton, right? Al, this is Al Sharpton who goes around to every corporation in America getting their money for his nonprofit and, and does very little against them. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember that Kendi appeared at an event for T-Mobile. You know, T-Mobile, I remember most vividly for crushing its unions and fighting uh, CWA and their German equivalent, right? Like, these are... When you have this platform, when you're given uh, these these positions, he could easily go to T-Mobile and say, well, if you want to help, you know, advance equity and, and, and justice for everybody, you should stop fighting these unions. You should you should acknowledge them and, uh, you know, stop forcing people to be in call centers all day and without rights and benefits and wages. Uh, you know, these are the sort of things you could be talking about in a practical level. But he just gives the exact same pitch everywhere he goes. It's the same thing as Shell Oil sponsoring Nicole Hannah-Jones. Right. None of these people or the uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are reading White Fragility and taking it on airplanes and having news stories written about that, right? Like, none of these people view this as an actual threat to their ideology because their ideology is not really, you know, they don't really care about the color of their skin. And they don't really, honestly, they don't really care about abortion or gay marriage or any of these issues either, right? They understand where society is going on those issues, getting more liberal or more libertarian. Uh, so they acknowledge it, but they're willing to talk about those things as a matter of building political support. And so right now, even Senator Josh Hawley, who I think is, he's much more thoughtful on these worker issues than the average Republican. All I've heard him talking about is the fact that Amy Coney, Amy Coney Barrett's a good social conservative, right? And he is very religious, and I understand that matters to him. But he could be helping install a judge that will be knocking down all kinds of things for workers, doing all kinds of things for big tech, for big pharma, for agribusness, uh, because those issues are just not being talked about. The only issues that are being talked about is Who's religious? Who's abortion? How anti-racist are you? How much do you do you do you hate you know white nationalism? Whatever, okay. But that's not those are not the issues that the Supreme Court is going to be dealing with over the next thirty or forty years. The next thirty or forty years could unfortunately look like something like the Lochner Court, which was in the late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds, which was a court that went around uh, decimating laws against child labor because it was basically overruling popular and populist majority uh, backed legislation on behalf of business and. It would be very unfortunate if we saw something like that again, because uh, it would mean that what most Americans want on a lot of these issues, bread and butter issues, would not be able to come to pass because the Supreme Court would rule it to be unconstitutional for the government to do anything about pay yeah. leave, about minimum wage, about antitrust, about uh, tech regulations, so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, it's very well said. And even if you're wrong that, you know, the social issues end up being more dominant in the court than they have been in years past or they rule differently than you might expect. It's insane to think that those are the only issues that we should be fixated on or talking about as we approach this um, upcoming confirmation fight. Zed, thank you so much. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Zed. Next on Rising, Michael Lind, he's calling for an entirely new model of labor law, and the policy expert's going to describe why when Rising continues.